Okay, this is, uh, <laughs> I always do that. Every time it opens up, I do that. Um, veins and arteries. First of all, let's get an understanding of what veins and arteries are. First of all, uh, arteries are what? What do they do? Arteries, what do they do? Versus veins. All arteries are thicker. They carry blood away. They what? Carry blood away. They carry blood away from the heart. Away from the heart. And what else do they do? They carry carry oxygenated blood. O2 blood, right? Right? What else do they do? They're thicker, they're stronger, they have more pressure in them. There's more pressure in, in, in arteries. There's more pressure. There's more pressure in arteries. Right? And are there more veins in arteries or more arteries in veins? There's more veins than arteries. There's many more veins than arteries. So there's a, there's a less amount, lesser amount, lesser amount of, 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 of arteries of arteries versus veins. Actually, it's about five times more. There's five times more veins in arteries. Okay, so, um, so uh, veins are thinner. They carry CO2, right? There are many more veins versus arteries. Many more. Uh, they carry blood to the heart. Deoxygenated. To the heart, yes. And this is deoxygenated blood, deoxy blood, deoxygenated blood. And there's less pressure. Okay, that all makes sense, right? This all makes sense to you, right? Basic, basic story about veins and arteries. So let's just talk about now the layers. Now, there is the intima, the intima of the heart, there's layers of the heart, you know that, right? It's a muscularis layer inside, right? Which is very thick in the arteries, right? Very strong. And then we have the the, ex the intima and the external areas. And these are just layers of the heart on the inner and the outer part. What's okay. the outer part? Uh, I think it's called the external part, the externa. There's the intima and the externa. But you'll have to look up those words. I'm, I'm trying to remember them as I'm speaking, but I'm blanking out. But there's that muscularis area in between, which is the source of its strength, okay? The source of its strength is here. You can look it up in your book on the anatomy of that wall, whoever has the book with them. Find the anatomy of the wall, you'll see that. Now there's also, when we talk about glands, we talk about the serosa layer, which is on the outside. The serosa layer, and then we have the muscularis area here, and then we have the endothelial layer on the inside, okay? So a lot of different types of descriptions of the outer layer versus the inner layers, and they use different words sometimes. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the artery being the muscularis area, being very, very thick in the, in the artery. And what is also true about these two things and by, uh, versus each other is that veins, have valves. That's a very big thing. They do not. These do not have valves. The the uh, the arteries do not have valves, but the veins do. Now, um, since it has more pressure, there's something I want to tell you. That's about the versus arteries versus veins as well. Arteries can expand out. They can actually open up and 
comply with the pressure. They spin, and then they recoil very easily. Veins do not like to do that. Veins do not like to stretch out and dilate and then recoil because their muscular areas are very thin. So they don't have that power of recoiling and stretching consistently. The veins are almost like rubber bands that ex uh, after you keep on stretching them, they lose their elasticity and then you wind up having a very, you know, uh, 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 a very, um, uh, the, the rubber band gets so flexible that it's not, has no integrity any longer, you understand? Mm -hmm. So the veins do not like to stretch. They don't like to they dilate. And we call that compatibility. When you are, when artery stretch and recoil, we call that being compliant. Okay, when we have compliance, they're able to stretch and recoil properly. Okay, so uh, the veins and arteries have very good, very good differences, and also put uh, positive compliance to stretch. Whereas arteries do not like to stretch. When veins, when veins stretch too much, you see it in the back of your leg sometimes. What are they called? Varicose, Varicose veins. When the, arter, when the veins stretch so much and they don't recoil well, then they stay stretched. And then they don't have any function because the, the blood is very sluggish there because it's so wide now, the, the blood just stagnates in that area, and they have, a, and it's dangerous to have that, uh, uh, because when blood doesn't move, it can clot, and it can cause uh, embolisms. In other words, when, the, when blood gets too thick, it can clot, that means it becomes like tissue, not fluid any longer, and now they can travel through the body and they can get into an artery or a vein and clog it up. And, and, and especially from the veins, the most common type of embolism is a pulmonary embolism, where it actually travels from the lower extremities, where you see those varicose veins very frequently, mm -hmm. right? And then they travel, and then all of a sudden, a piece of this tissue that came from the clotted blood starts to travel up and then it goes into the heart and then it goes into the lungs and it causes a clot there and that's a pulmonary embolism when you when the clot moves to another area and we try to avoid them by increasing circulation and that's by walking a lot of walking we tell people to have varicose veins or they they have a a, 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 a a risk factor for it uh, leg exercises are very important Contracting the muscle, which is one of the one of the ways you can increase circulation of veins, is by walking and contracting the lower extremities, which is where it normally happens. Because remember, all the gravity is down below, so we ha it has to push its way up. So it becomes difficult for veins to uh, accommodate that sometimes, and uh, they become varicose veins. And there's collateral circulation with veins, so you can take one out. And we used to take them out. We used to just take out these varicose veins like spaghetti. Mm -hmm. Fish, yeah. afterwards. Mine hey. out. Right, you can do that, but now we have different techniques where we fibro fibrose it with, 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 um, with uh, fib fibrotic uh, sti uh, um, uh, stimulus. Did, 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 did we like just laser? yes we just we just fibrose the whole thing it's like almost like um it's like it's like putting dirt in a cave we're just creating it so it doesn't have anything in it so it doesn't cause any any uh, circulation problems but aesthetically does it still look ugly is it better to take them off it can yeah yeah you know if you have a lot of them absolutely well you know plastic surgeon you should go to okay. he'll straighten it all out for you um you know you have to do that sometimes um, but yeah, taking them out sometimes can cause scarring. I don't know. I mean, you know, there's the, the technique today is better, from what I understand. I mean, and, it's, and it's not uh, a, 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 a procedure uh, uh, that's, um, that's uh, uh, cutting and taking out. It's no bloods involved. Mm -hmm. So it's not, uh, it's not uh, there's, there's no risk factor mm -hmm. to getting infections. Right. Okay, so uh, veins and arteries, okay? So the, the, and, the, and, the, and the vein would look like this. 
very thin, very thin, very thin, very thin, and it has valves. And the valves actually help push up the, the as, it, as it's going up, these valves push it up, they push it up on each side. And they, that's how the blood travels through the veins. Now, remember, the pressure of veins is very low. In any particular vein at any given time, it's about anywhere between uh, 15 to 25 millimeters of Hertz. Of, this, is, this is pressure. When we do this, that signifies pressure. So that's what that is. 15 to 25 in the vein. Arteries are what? And that's what, uh, that's what the pressure is what helps move the blood. Well, it helps it out a little bit. This needs the valves to keep it going up because they can stagnate. They can remember if once this starts to stretch, these valves don't touch each other anymore, and you know, they wind up becoming incompetent. And all of a sudden, they're this far apart. They're not, and they're trying, but there's no, there's nothing in the middle, <laughs> so it stagnates blood. So you know, just uh, uh, the contraction of muscle is the best way to get it going. It will contract the muscles by squeezing them together, and then it can it can send the blood better to the circulation that way, okay? And we also use pressure socks. You've seen those stockings. Mm -hmm. You put them on, it presses against them so that they have more pressure around the, around, the mem or, 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 or around the external area, so they press it together. So there's, there's a, so that's what the veins are, and, and veins are very thin, remember that? There's five times more veins than arteries. And they all need, they all have valves. That's how you can identify them. And they're deoxygenated blood. So um, let's talk, yes? And how come arteries don't need valves? They have because there's so much pressure there, they don't need the valves. They're just, it's like a bullet. The bullet doesn't need help to travel. <laughs> but a water gun does. <laughs> She's trying to shake it to make it go further. You know, but bullets, that's where the bullet, that I describe an artery like a bullet. It goes fast. Where does it get their pressure from? Where does it get its pressure from? From the heart's pumping, pumping out into the circulation. Gotcha, okay. Okay? So that's understood. So, um... So make sure you know the differences between them. But uh, now we're going to talk about the major arteries of the, of the body, okay? So let's talk about the um, aorta, the first uh, artery that comes out of the heart. There's an anatomy there, so I need you to, to see this. Can I erase this? Yes. That's a nice color, by the way. Hmm. Okay, so... This is the aorta coming out of the heart, okay? You see that, right? Mm -hmm. It's coming out of the heart. This is where the heart is. Okay, and this is the left ventricle. Okay, and here's your aorta right there, right? And it's coming out. Okay, first of all, uh, we gotta talk about this. When it first comes out, there is an aortic arch. There's an ascending aortic arch. There is the loop aortic loop or the aortic arch and then there is the descending loop okay there's the ascending arch is the ascending aortic arch there's the aortic arch itself which is also called the loop and then we have the descending aortic arch okay there's three parts to the aorta okay now there's three arteries that come out of this top area, which is going to go towards, two of them are going to go up here, the left and the right carotid arteries, and then you're going to have the left and the right subclavian arteries. This is what it takes care of, the upper extremities. So this aortic arch is going to have, on the right side, the right brachio, brachio, cephalic trunk. That's for the loop. What? That's for the loop? 
No, it's coming out of the loop. This first artery that comes out okay. is the right brachiocephalic artery. Cephalic artery. This will then bifurcate into the right carotid artery and the right subclavian artery. Subclavian artery. You want me to spell it for you? The brachiocephalic, the right brachiocephalic artery or trunk and then this is going to bifurcate into two things. One of them is going to be the right carotid artery which is going to go to the brain the right carotid artery is going to go to the brain and then we have the right subclavian artery which is going to do the right side of my arm this is major, major league circulation, What's guys. What's the first one? I'm so sorry. All right. right. So coming out of the right side, I, it's going to loop over. It's going to yeah. become the right carotid artery and the right subclavian artery. Okay? Out of the brachiocephalic trunk. The right brachiocephalic trunk. Mm -hmm. And the, the carotid? Carot the right carotid goes straight up the <coughs> neck. Goes to the, okay. goes to the right side of the brain. Okay? And you were saying that the other one goes to the arm? The sub right subclavian. Handles the right upper, upper, upper the chest and arm mm -hmm. for their arteries. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then we're going to have the next one that's going to come out, and that's going to be all by itself the left carotid artery. So that's going to be the left carotid artery on the other side. And then this one's going to be by itself the left subclavian artery. What's that? The left, goes, the left and the right are exactly the same, only they're, one's called left, one's called right. And the fact that the right brachiocephalic is handling the right side of these two guys on the right side. It's called the brachiocephalic artery, which these two guys don't have. These two guys don't have a trunk, the left brachiocephalic trunk. They don't have that. Uh -huh. They just have something on their own. The right, the right side has a brachiocephalic trunk, and I'll describe it to you. I'll show it to you. All right, watch this. This is, the, this is the aortic arch, okay? This is the aortic arch. This is the right side. This is the right brachiocephalic trunk. It goes like this, and then it pops up like that for the right side. It'll mm -hmm. pop it up, and this is the right carotid artery, and then this, and then this will continue on to the right subclavian artery, which is going to handle the right arm. Right, just the right arm? No, the right arm with some of the pectoralis. Uh, in, uh, um, arteries, but it's all about the upper extremities on the right side. Upper extremities on the right side. Okay, that's what I want. These are the upper extremities on the left side. Okay, so you have to just see this picture of the aortic arch to draw that again, because I'm going to be going into the brain a little bit. I really need you to understand this. So. So if I'm drawing the, the, the human head, say I'm, this is the shoulder, this is the head, okay? And we're going down like this, okay? These are the arms. This is your heart, okay? Okay, here's your aorta. It's gonna come around like this. It's gonna come around like this, right? Mm -hmm. It's gonna go like that as your arch, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me do that. And then it's gonna have these three And then it's going to go down. So this one's the right brachiocephalic trunk, right? And then this one's going to go out like this and send it to the right 
subclavian artery, this one's going to go up to the right side of the brain. Okay, from the right, this is the trunk. So it just splits up, and the other one doesn't? The other one doesn't have a trunk, it just goes to the left side, the left carotid artery, and then this one goes to the left subclavian artery. You follow my drift? You yeah, follow it? Yeah. So you got to just remember that. The, left, the right side has a trunk. The brachiocephalic trunk, they call it. It's just the way God did this. We didn't do this. God did this. Okay? So, with that understood, we're going to go into the brain a little bit. Okay, because in the brain, now all of a sudden now we have the head, right? This is the neck and this is the brain. Okay? So here's your carotid arteries on each side, right? They're going to have another artery right here that's going to enter into the brain, and that's going to be called the vertebral, vertebral artery, left and right. Okay? The vertebral arteries, right, vertebral artery and they both enter into the center of the brain this brain this this artery right there is called the basilar artery the basilar artery this is the center of your brain where the major arteries are located okay so you have the vertebral arteries once you got the carotid artery going up your brain and then it's going to slant to, into each other and it's going to be called the vertebral arteries then they're going to meet and they're going to be called one big artery called the basilar artery. They, they meet which artery? They meet at the basilar artery. And they both intervene at the basilar center. Okay? So they go like this. So they go like this. This is how they go. And then one. Yeah, I know. So the vertebral, right? Yeah, the vertebral arteries are the extensions out. Uh -huh. And then the basilar artery is where they meet. Okay, you get it? And once it gets into the basilar artery, then all these arteries become cerebral arteries. The posterior cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, right? The interlobular cerebral arteries. They get into smaller arteries. The posterior cerebral artery, it comes out of here, is the artery of stroke. We call that the artery of stroke. That's where most strokes happen. The artery of stroke. The posterior cerebral artery is the artery of stroke. Okay? And all the other arteries that are going to be going through this brain are going to be tiny ones. The anterior cerebral artery is another one. When they come out of here first, they're larger, but once they go into the brain, they're tiny. The interlobular, the lobular artery, the interlobular artery, they become very tiny. You understand? And they feed the rest of the brain. You understand this, right? Is the brain bloody? Extremely. Yeah. Extremely bloody. It needs a lot of energy. And it uses a lot of fat in itself to make itself with ATP, but it needs a lot of oxygen. And the oxygen depri deprivation is only three minutes in the, in the brain. After three minutes, the brain starts to die. Tissues start to die after about three minutes of no oxygen. Uh, um, so we have to kind of get that going. The colder the, the water, like say you're drowning and you're, it's an ice cold and you die from suffocation, but if it's really, really cold, you can extend that time of damage to like maybe eight minutes or 10 minutes, you can get that person back because the cold weather and cold slows down the metabolism of tissue, so you don't need the oxygen as much. When we transport organs, we put them in cold, we put them in ice coolers to keep them cold so that they don't need so much energy to survive. Kidneys we send in with a machine, so they're working. We have a kidney machine. We have kidney machines hooked up to the kidneys, and then we're bringing them to a transplant. They're already working, <laughs> but like the heart, no, it's just there. It's pumping like this. It's going boop, boop. You understand? It's just a little bit of a movement, and we have to get it someplace quickly. And sometimes we'll stick some tubes in there to keep it going. But um, the uh, the fact of the matter is that when it's cold, 
you can you have a longer period of time of of, of damage before it damages when it's a cold when it's a cold temperature of your body. Anyway, so does everybody understand that? The major ones are the carotid to the vertebral to the basilar. And then the anterior cerebral arteries, the posterior cerebral arteries, the middle cerebral arteries. And then once they get from there, they become interlobular arteries, lobular arteries, and they get very small and tiny. When you get into this particular basilar artery, we call that the circle of Willis. That's an area called the circle of Willis. We call it the circle of Willis. Circle of Willis. It's a spider looking thing because it looks like this. It has eight legs, and the guy put a face on it like that. So it looks like a spider. So then they call it the Circle of Willis. Circle, circle of Willis. It looked like a spider, so they called it the Circle of Willis. I don't know why. You should look up, when you see, when you look up this, put in the Circle of Willis, you'll see that. It's the basilar. Do you see it now? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> the circle of Willis. Does it look like a spider? Yeah. <laughs> it looks like a spider. I'm sorry I can't draw like that. <laughs> I'm so bad at that. <sighs> okay. Did they talk about the anterior, the, the posterior cerebral artery being the artery of stroke? Type in the artery of stroke. Type in the artery of stroke and see what artery they say. Anyway, um, so that's the arteries of the brain, okay? I'm just going that far in. We're going to go down now. Okay, we're going to go start going down into the lower extremities, okay? So we're going to take this aortic a aorta that's already done for. This is done. We well, don't have to worry about that. But now it's going to start going into the abdomen because now... This is the thoracic area. When it goes into the thoracic area, the artery changes its name. The aorta changes its name to the thoracic aorta. When it's in the chest, it's called the thoracic aorta. When it's, in, when it's leaving the heart, it's called the ascending aortic arch, the aortic arch, and the descending aortic arch. When it leaves that, it's called the thoracic aorta. Okay? And it's going to travel down, and it's going to go past into the abdomen, this is the diaphragm, so it has its way of going in, okay? So it's gonna go in, and it's gonna start, and this is where we're gonna have a lot of different arteries that are major league arteries, and you have to understand that when you first get into the abdomen, the stomach is here, the liver is here, the, uh, the esophagus, you know the esophagus? It goes into the stomach, mm -hmm. that's there, esophagus. The spleen is here, the pancreas is here, right? This is all the areas that we're trying, the gallbladder is here, okay? The intestines is here, intestines. So we're gonna have to feed all of these, arter all these organs, so this is major league stuff. The first artery, okay? Now let me do this right. The first artery, that comes out, it's going to be right here, it's called the celiac artery, celiac artery. It's the first artery that, 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 that comes out of the, of the aorta, and it's going to bifurcate. And it's going to bifurcate into the hepatic artery, hepatic artery. You said it's going to what? It's going to bifurcate, you know, to come out and spread itself out to the hepatic artery, which is the liver, the, 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 the cystic artery or, this, or the, for the gallbladder. Here is the gastric artery for the stomach, right? The, the gastric artery for the stomach, the pancreatic artery, pancreatic artery. This is all coming out of the celiac, out of the celiac. It's the major, major guy, the pancreatic artery, the esophageal artery, the splenic artery. You understand? 
That's where the celiac, the celiac's handling everything up here. All of the organs that are above the intestines are being handled by the celiac artery. Okay? As we go down, we're going to have the renal arteries. The renal artery. And this is all by skipping for the from the no, from the from the aorta. No, celiac's done. Okay. Celiac is done. It gave you like seven or eight arteries. That's it. Okay. Now it's gonna go. Now the aorta is going down more. Oh, so it, it keeps traveling. Okay. The, key, the aorta keeps on traveling. It's called the abdominal aorta now. When it, remember the thoracic aorta? Now it's called the abdominal aorta. It changes its name, and the first bifurcation is the celiac artery. What does the celiac artery give you? The gastric artery, the hepatic artery, the pancreatic artery, the splenic artery, the, the, the esophageal artery, all of, everything from up here is going to give you. You understand? Okay, so it changes what's the, the bottom now it's... Now it's going to be, now as it goes down to the abdominal aorta, the, the renal arteries are going to start, those are big, big arteries, the renal arteries to feed the kidneys. Gotcha. You understand? <clears throat> And also, something is going to come out. Right below it, or above it, you're going to get the mesenteric arteries, mesenteric artery, and it's going to be the superior mesenteric arteries. And the superior mesenteric artery is going to feed the large intestines and some of the small intestines. You understand this? The mesenteric artery is the largest arterial system in the body. It's covering all the arteries of the, of the digestive system. It's big. The largest, the largest arterial supply. The mesenteric arteries are the largest arterial supply, organ system-wise. It's covering the small and the large intestines. It's big. You know how big your intestines is? It's mm -hmm. gigantic. The mesenteric arteries take care of this. So there's a superior and an inferior mesenterics. They cover the large and the small intestines. And they also handle the, the, the urinary bladder. The urinary bladder is down here. They also handle the urinary bladder. And as you go further down, the penile area is also handled by, the, by those, by, by those uh, bifurcations of those arteries. Okay, so do you understand that? Is that understood? Can I erase this? This mess? This jigsaw puzzle that I just did? Because we're going to go a little, now we're going to go further down, okay? Because uh, now that we've handled the abdomen, okay, this is the abdomen, okay? And we're going down, and all of a sudden now, we're going to go towards the legs. And, yes, go ahead, Tell, talk to me. Try to understand. Hold on. Um, okay, good. The so the mesenteric artery is it's coming from the renal, right? No, no, no. The mesenterics are coming from the abdominal aorta. The the yeah. renal artery is on its own. It comes out uh, at T twelve. That's where it comes out. Gotcha. Going down the going down the abdomen T twelve. That's where it, the kidneys are found. That's where the uh, 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 the renal artery is. The re and the renal's coming from the abdominal, right? Abdominal aorta, straight from it. Gotcha. As a matter of fact, if you want to get a little more technical about it, the, the, uh, the, the right kidney is lower than the left kidney, so the artery that comes out of the ab abdomen, uh, out of the aorta, the renal artery, is shorter coming out of the right side than it is the left. The left has a longer renal artery because it's higher. Well, we'll get, we'll get into that later, okay? I'm not gonna talk about that right now. Okay. So, as we're leaving the abdomen and we're going into the major thigh area, this is gonna become the, the um, iliac artery. So wait, let me show you. So here's your aorta and it bifurcates like this. So this is your renal arteries here, 
right? Your mesenterics are here. So all this is going on, and as it goes further down, then it's going to start, it's going to start right at the iliac bone, right where those hips are. It's going to, there's going to be two arteries that are going to go left and right, and then you're going to start with the mid. So, so this is the iliac iliac artery. It's going to bifurcate into two major arteries right here called the femoral femoral arteries. Okay. Those big arteries right here in the flag, the femoral arteries. Iliac arteries. Iliac arteries and then the femoral arteries, which are going to go down the right and the left leg, which is the right side and the left side. And then you have, as it travels down, your femoral arteries will end, and then it starts to bifurcate into smaller arteries, depending on the muscle that it's innervating. So the femoral artery stops here at the top of the knee, so then all those other arteries are gonna be smaller, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the arteries of the foot and the calf muscles, which are very small. And they're, they're more, they're not as important as the larger ones. Okay, the, so, so the femoral artery is where I want you to stop to learn. But remember, there's, there's arteries further down, okay? The, uh, there's the soleus muscle down here with the calf, the gastronomicus muscle down there. They have arteries down there too, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not mentioning it. Just get to know it, okay? I'm talking about the major, the major system going on here. Mm -hmm. You said the iliac uh, artery? Has go left and right? Yeah, there's one that goes to the left and one to the right, and then it goes down each to femoral artery, right? So femoral arteries are big. They're thick, big arteries. They can kill you. If you cut your femoral arteries, you can die real easy. They bleed out badly. You get stabbed in the art and in the leg, or your car accident in the leg, and you're in trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. More trouble than if you were getting stabbed or shot in the abdomen. The femoral artery gets gets ripped. You're in a lot of. You're not going to last too long. That blood's just pouring out, and it pours out quickly. You got to put that. You got to put a strap next to it. It's very hard to stop. Very hard to stop. Leg injuries are incredibly hard to stop. So are abdominal injuries hard to stop. But what do you do? What's the what's what do you do when you try to stop bleeding? What do you try to do? What are you going to do? Put pressure on it. That's all. That's all you can do. And if you're really good at what you do, you can find where the artery is cut and just squeeze it. <laughs> just squeeze the artery like that. And wait till help comes because you got it. It's going to be terrible. All right, so does everybody understand that? That's very easy, right? It's very easy stuff, isn't it? So now I want you to know about some of the important parts of the veins. Uh, the veins are five times more, right? But there's an area of the veins that are very important. In the liver, it's called the portal system. The portal system of the veins. Portal system. Portal. The portal system. The portal system. It's located in the liver. Big, big, big. Now, the major veins of the uh, body, of the of the body going to the heart, is the inferior. You know this inferior vena cava. And from the head, it's the superior vena cava, right? You know that. That's from the, that's from the heart we talked about. Remember, uh, the, those are the two major veins that everything ultimately empties out into. All the veins everywhere in the body, ultimately on the bottom, on the lower extremities, all wind up in the inferior vena cava. Everything from the top here in the upper extremities all empty out into the... Superior vena cava. And they all empty out into where? The right atrium. Right? Deoxygenated blood, right? Mm -hmm. Is that understood? Now, most of the arteries in the veins have share their names, right? It's, but say in, instead of saying artery, it's called a vein, right? Uh, uh, the femoral artery, there's a femoral vein. Right? Right? Okay. So you don't have to memorize different veins, but there's certain ones that you need to. Like in the carotid artery, what's the vein called? What's the vein called in your neck? It's not the carotid vein, it's called the jugular vein. So you gotta know that. The jugular vein, the jugular vein. The jugular vein. Instead of saying 
the hepatic artery for the hepatic vein. They call it the portal veins of the, of the liver. You understand this? When it's renal artery, it's a renal vein. Easy. You don't gotta worry about that, right? Mesenteric arteries, mesenteric veins. Okay, I like it. Gastric arteries, gastric veins. Pancreatic artery, pancreatic vein. They, they match themselves with the same last name. There's just a few things that are not the same. So those are the things that I want you to remember, okay? The, the, the jugular vein going to the heart. Remember, it goes, where does the jugular vein empty out into? The superior vena cava. And then goes into the right side of the heart. The subclavian arteries, the subclavian veins, where do they go? To the superior vena cava. And then empty out into the right atrium. You get this, right? And everything, everything else starts from down here and up to here. This is where the inferior vena cava comes in. Okay? Understand that. In the heart, they're, they're, cardi they're called cardiac sinuses. The cardiac sinus is the cardiac veins. It's not called the coronary veins. It's called the cardiac sinuses or the, or the veins of the heart. The jugular vein, it comes, it's, it's opposite, it comes, the, 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 the carotid artery is, is the one that goes to the brain, the jugular vein is the one that goes away from the brain. So it's, mm -hmm. it's the vein of the, of the, uh, of the carotid, but we don't call it carotid vein, we call it the jugular vein. You, you understand, why? It's called the jugular, um, the, the carotid artery versus the, the jugular vein. But I'm just trying to tell you that most everywhere else, it's the same name. Jugular, uh, 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 um, <clears throat> gastric artery, gastric vein. So the carotid artery is going, taking blood to the brain, and then the jugular vein is taking blood away from the brain to the heart. Well, it, it's in the neck. It's not yeah. from the brain, but it's, it's from the brain that, that that venous blood's going to. Gotcha. And it okay. enters out, and it empties out into the superior vena cava. Yeah which goes into the right atrium, which is where we want it to go, right? All arteries go towards the heart, all, arteries, uh, all veins go towards the heart, all arteries go away from the heart, okay? Knowing that is important. Okay, so, um, so let's just talk about, um, so now you, you know the veins and arteries, and now you got all your diagrams, right? Oh no, you don't do diagrams. You're gonna do your exams. You don't do diagrams, and he's lucky. Very lucky. Who asked me for lab? Not so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I just want you to understand what deoxygenated blood is and oxygenated blood. It's very important to understand. When we have, uh, and now we're done with the, with the arteries and veins, that's easy, right? Wasn't that easy to do? You know, know those layers of the vein, know the layers of the arteries as far as the walls, know that veins have valves, arteries don't, pressure, you know that, I told you everything, so it's no problem as far as understanding it. But I need you to understand what deoxygenated blood is. Deox oxygenated blood versus deoxygenated blood is this. If I was to draw two exactly the same uh, 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 diagrams here, and I put a hemoglobin next to it because a red blood cell, remember, has three names. Red blood cell has three names. <laughs> a red blood cell, a hemoglobin molecule, or a urethrocyte. Everything there is telling me this. That's what that is. Hemoglobin, red blood cell, a urethrocyte, all are the same thing. So, I'm gonna put hemoglobin on all these guys because my point is going to be very clear when you are oxygenated this is what you're going to see O2 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 and O2 this is what oxygenation means by the way I have an empty box there this is necessary to make the hemoglobin molecule what is it iron. yes it's iron very good Iron is always in hemoglobin. It needs it to make it. And uh, obviously if you bleed too much in menstruation or if you are losing blood chronically for any particular reason, 
um, we give you iron to make more hemoglobin. Okay. Uh, and by the way, the bone marrow make red blood cells, right? Mm -hmm. The bone marrow makes the red blood cells in the bone marrow, which is a mechanism of red marrow that stimulates it through a hormone called urethropoietin. Poietin. Urethropoietin is the hormone that increases red blood cell production in the bone marrow. It's the hormone that travels there. You remember that from your endocrine? Yes, of course you do. And, it's, and the reason why it's, uh, it, the hormone gets secreted is because it senses low oxygen or low volume. Those two reasons we will increase the hormone urethropoietin, and it comes from the kidneys. The kidneys are a smart organ, but they really don't know why they're smart. They're just smart. They will sense in their very tedious, complicated apparatus inside the, the, uh, the kidneys, they can sense low volume and or low oxygen levels in your body, and they will secrete urethropoietin and something else. Who knows the other one? Renin. And we remember what renin does? Renin is a vasoconstrictor. It goes to the liver to become uh, angiotensin 1 and then to the lungs to become angiotensin 2, which is a vasoconstrictor. And it, uh, when it becomes severe, your, your angiotensin 2 will protect the vital organs of the body and not allow other organs to get blood supply as much. But, so it's the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, the, the heart, and the, and the uh, liver. Say that, uh, the brain, I'm sorry. So it's brain, kidneys, lungs, liver, and heart. The five vital organs will be increased in circulation when the others will be sacrificed because those are the five vital organs. And that's what the angiotensin II does in its, ex in, in its extreme. But normally, angiotensin II causes hypertension. <laughs> and it makes your, makes your blood pressure high. <clears throat> and when you have this without any reason of low volume or low oxygen, then it's called essential hypertension. And you have to treat that because there's no reason behind it happening, but we have to stop it from happening because hypertension is a bad thing to have chronically. You want your blood pressures to always be low because it causes organ damage when you have it high. It's a high, it's a high risk of stroke, high risk of blindness, a high risk of, 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 of heart attacks. So you want to lower your blood pressure to lower that risk factor. You understand? And that can happen with just being who you are. There's no reason behind it. It's called essential hypertension, a very common reason. And there's medicine for it, very good medicine. Okay? So urethropoietin is sent to the uh, bone marrow to make more red blood cells. And red blood cells are the most abundant cell in the body. They're the most abundant cell in the body. They have more red blood cells than any other cell in the body. Very good to know that. Uh, its job is just to pick up oxygen and send it to the, or to the muscles and, and, to, and to pick up CO2. And it, it's the only cell, or one of the only cells, it doesn't have a nucleus has no nucleus to it, so it doesn't really know what it's doing. It just does things. It just carries the oxygen, and it doesn't even deliver the oxygen. It actually gets, it, it's actually taken. In other words, when you, if I was to carry a whole bunch of food in my hand, and I was to pass by, and you were just to take it, that's the way the muscles do it with the red blood cell. They just take the oxygen from the red blood cell as it's passing by, and it gives it the CO2. You understand? <laughs> and because uh, it's because uh, it's it doesn't need to think about it. It just it just passes by without thinking, and it will just take it. And then the red blood cells will just be sent to the to the heart. They don't go to the heart; they're sent to the heart because that's where they go. They go into veins, and they get sent back through you know through the circulation. So they the don't take the oxygen, and then they get what? They, they, give, they get CO2 from the muscle from the previous delivery, right? They use up the oxygen and they have CO2. They have to give that away. They don't keep CO2. Well, if they keep CO2, that's called anaerobic activity, when you don't have enough oxygen. 
And then you, whenever, you, whenever you exercise, you know when you exercise and you don't have enough oxygen to feed your, your muscles, the next day you're all achy, ow, 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 because the muscles uh, don't use oxygen anymore. They use glucose to, uh, to burn energy and they wind up creating lactic acidosis or lactic acid. And lactic acid accumulates in your muscle. That's what hurts. That's what you have to do that so you have to stretch it and get it out into the circulation. It goes to the liver and it makes energy for you. Makes two ATP. A lactic acid molecule makes two ATP. That's amazing to me. A lactic, like a waste product, can make mm -hmm. energy. And then there's a pathway that makes it. It's all about recycling in the body. What? I said it's all about recycling. In the, the body recycles a lot of stuff. We've yet to talk about what recycles. Because the red blood cell can also get recycled. You know what hemoglobin is called when it gets destroyed? You know how long a red blood cell lives? 120 days, that's its life cycle. About three months. Oh, three, six, nine, twelve. Yeah, about four months. And then it dies. How does it die? Well, the spleen has a lot to do with that. The spleen can just help destroy old red blood cells. But it also can destroy itself in the arteries and veins by just the stress of being there. It just dissipates. And the, pro the byproduct of hemoglobin is called, what? You know what that is? You know what it's called? Billy Rubin. Billy Rubin. Billy Rubin is the byproduct of hemoglobin. Yeah, in other words, when the hemoglobin gets destroyed, it becomes bilirubin. And albumin, which is the protein in our bodies, has to carry that to the liver. It can't be roaming around by itself. It's a, this is a toxin. It's toxic. <clears throat> so Billy Rubin is a waste product? Of hemoglobin destruction, of, of the red blood cell destruction. And the albumin has to carry it to the, the albumin protein molecule carries the, the bilirubin to the liver to become biliverdin. To, it, it uses this waste product to become biliverdin, which is used in bile. Mm, okay. And we'll discuss that when we discuss digestion. So, so waste products are always being used. They're always being used. And the, sorry, Go back ahead. to that drawing. The bottom one is a deoxygenator. So this is deoxygenator. So this is oxygenated. We call this 100% saturation. This is going to be CO2, CO2, and then another O2, and another O2. This is what we are in the veins. Half of the molecule of the vein is deoxygenated, which means it's, has, it's carrying CO2 in just two branches, normally. If you're exercising, maybe a third one, but never all four of them. That never happens, okay? Just either three or two. And um, this is the oxygen. So there's oxygen on our red blood cells, even though it's in the veins. So when you say deoxygenated, that does not mean we have zero oxygen. That just means we have partial oxygen, okay? You understand that, right? Well, when you breathe out, is that, do we breathe out any oxygen? No. Yes, we do. We breathe out, no. we breathe out oxygen. We breathe only about 7%. Out of the 21% oxygen that we breathe in, about 7% gets breathed out. Because we don't need all 21%. We're just handling these two guys. We understand? And maybe a third one. So we, we're, we're only using a little bit or using a, a major portion of that oxygen, but not all of it. So that's why when we do CPR, we give them two breaths. If there wasn't oxygen in there, we wouldn't give them the two breaths. Why would we? Why would we give somebody CO2? We wouldn't do that. We give them the oxygen. That's why we give them only two breaths. You understand this, right? You understand this logic? If I was to breathe out, if I'm not breathing out oxygen, then why am I giving this guy breaths? It doesn't make sense. So there has to be oxygen in there. <laughs> right? Because that's what I used to question. I go, why are we breathing into them? It's all CO2. It's not. It's, there's oxygen in there. And it can use. But we still have oxygen, right? Half of the hemoglobin is, is oxygenated. So that's why compressions are more important than the breaths. Because if you keep on circulating the oxygen, the, the, the red blood cell through the body, it can still take one more oxygen from that branch. You understand? 
and you can still get oxygenated a little bit until help arrives. Can you just do compression? Yeah, absolutely. You don't need, I mean, you like to do at least one or two breaths, but you don't have to. Yeah, when I took a CPR class, that's the, like, I, when I had to renew it, yes. when I went to renew it, they said that we didn't have to breathe in. Right, because you, know, you can get all kinds of diseases also. Yeah. You can get herpes and stuff, yeah. but I have a thing. You know, my I have a thing. I'm gonna bring it to you guys. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you guys all a present. There's this thing. I have one of these things that has a little plastic thing in here in case you need to give somebody breath. It's an apparatus that you put around the, uh, uh, your mouth, you, and you breathe in to him. You understand? You can give him his breath. Or you I know. I think you put it around him, and then you you breathe out. But it's a little nozzle. And it doesn't go back to you. It's only a one-way valve. Anyway, um, so uh, do you understand this? Do you understand this de uh, de uh, uh, um, deoxygenation versus oxygenation, right? You understand all that. So understanding this <clears throat> is a very simple, logical understanding of how the circulation goes through it. Now remember. <clears throat> Coming out of the aorta, remember we talked about blood pressures already, right? We talked yeah. about what the 120 over 80 means. Did we do that yet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that we, that you know that that compliance of that aorta, of that aorta opening up and allowing that blood to rush through it, how, depending on how much it stretches, is that top number, that systolic num number. Mm -hmm. If it's tight, then the number will go high. If it opens up a lot, then the number will be low. And less stressed on the heart, if it's low, right? The heart doesn't have to press, the heart doesn't have to contract so hard to get the blood out. Obviously, it's less work on the heart, less oxygen demand on the heart, less work on the heart. The heart will last longer that way, right? Mm -hmm. This is the whole, whole reason why low blood pressure is so important. You follow me, right? Did you bring that physics class today? Oh, you got to tell me these things. Mm -hmm. Please? Will you please remind me? And I'll put it, I'll do it tonight. I'll just put it in my bag tonight. Mm -hmm. So I'll remember. I wanted to hear that heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, so uh, does anybody have any questions about, uh, about the arteries and veins? Mm -hmm. Now, remember something. When an artery and a vein meet, that's a, this is an artery. And we have a little scribbling here. And then we have veins. A vein is 120 millihertz of pressure. These guys are 25 or 35 or 25, whatever the case might be, or 15, right? 15, whatever the, case, whatever the pressures are. And there's a little intermedium right there. What's that called? That's called a capillary. And capillaries is where there is gas exchange. That's where the artery, that's where the oxygen and CO2 exchange hands. It has to happen in the capillary, okay? So when the artery gets to a muscle where the red blood cell needs to feed the muscle, it's gonna have to have a capillary system right there so it can exchange the arteries, the oxygen for CO2. So whenever I ask you about a capillary, the answer is always going to be gas exchange. That's where it happens. Gas exchange happens in the capillaries. Oxygen and CO2 levels are all being exchanged in the capillaries. It's the most abundant apparatus in the body. Capillaries are the most abundant apparatus in the body. The most abundant. Okay? So... With that in mind, is there anything else that we can talk about? Well, arteries and veins are pretty basic, right? There's nothing um, not to understand. Now is your, is your time to read up a little bit about it. There's some things that I may not have mentioned to you. Uh, you can always mention it to me. I'll be writing, uh, I'll be, I'll be um, continuing this on with, uh, with blood. How much time do we have left on this?